They all alike began to make excuses. First said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I must go out and see it. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I have just been married and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Thus ends our reading today. The Spirit works in mysterious ways sometimes. Our worship planners and leaders can attest to the fact that I chose this text three or four weeks ago for today, but I got some new insight into this text just this week. Some of you will remember the name Center for Congregations. That is a group in Indiana that is administered by the Lilly Foundation and gives Lilly funds to congregations. That's where we got, Creekside got our Holy Welcome program that we did last fall. But they also do workshops and webinars and online presentations. There was a workshop this past Thursday that Ron saw, Ron Nicodemus saw online and Ron and Jan and I went on Thursday. Uh, there was a terrific presenter named Michael McCarg he is a uh, podcaster and blogger and a great presenter. I'll be talking about him a little bit later. But I want to look at this story from Luke. It's one of the parables of Jesus, and a very similar parable appears in Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew, this parable of the great dinner is described as a wedding feast. In Luke, it's called a great dinner. Either way, it was a big deal, especially for the host. Maybe not so much for the guests. I know that many of you have probably been involved in planning a wedding. I hope you were involved in planning your own weddings, but maybe you even had a greater emotional and financial investment in planning the wedding of a daughter, or a sister, or a niece, or a friend. I have been there. I have two daughters who have been married, and I remember as we were in the planning part of that, and especially trying to figure out the food and the meal, waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat and thinking, what if everybody comes? What are we going to do? And then, Hours later, I would wake up even more panicked and thinking, what if nobody comes? What are we going to do? Weddings and great dinners were different in Palestine 2,000 years ago than they are now, but the pressure of being the host and inviting guests hasn't changed. Jesus, of course, is not telling a literal story about something that actually happened to somebody he knows. He is using this story and a situation that would be familiar to virtually everyone to illustrate the kingdom of God. His audience was the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, the A-list guests who had turned up their noses at the invitation to believe in Jesus and share in the abundance of the kingdom of God. Jesus makes it clear in both versions of this parable that if the invited guests do not accept the invitation, others will be brought to the Lord's table. And those others are poor, crippled, blind, and lame. Not a very glamorous bunch. We then, who are here today, have been invited as guests with Jesus Christ as our host. But 
we're the B list guests, maybe even C or D list. We're not the best looking, the best dressed, the most powerful, the wealthiest. For heaven's sakes, we're not even the most moral or the best behaved. We just showed up because Jesus said it was okay and we were hungry. If you think you're too good for this group, you're probably right. We're kind of a sorry bunch. So in light of our identity as a sorry bunch, and you can substitute the word sinner if you want, it's the same thing, I have a proposal. Some of you are not going to like it. That's okay. We can talk about it after the service or whenever you want to. My proposal does not take financial resources, but it might take significant emotional investment. This isn't a new idea. You've heard it from me before, and I think it's pretty firmly grounded in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I'm going to give you this proposal in two words so that you can leave here today with this memorized. Are you ready? Do you want to hear it? Welcome everyone. This is really not a program for the church. It's more a posture of how we approach people who are in this space. And that posture should not be get off my lawn. That posture should be, you are welcome here. Now I told you I would get to Michael McCard, the presenter that we heard on Thursday. Michael specializes in a group of people that he calls millennials. Millennials are people in the United States who were born between 1980 and 2000. And he does research about and does a podcast that many of those millennials are an audience for. And he reaches about 2 million people with that podcast. They don't really like the label millennials. They don't really like being labeled at all but that's a handy framework for the rest of us. Here's some things about millennials that you probably already know. Millennials are leaving the church in greater numbers than any generation in American history. It isn't just the church that they're leaving. It's all kinds of institutional things, parent-teacher organizations, civic community clubs, financial institutions, political parties. This group is not looking to do things the way that their parents did. And as a group, they skew differently than their parents on social issues, gender roles, and marriage roles, and when or if they're going to be married at all. Creekside's future will be in the hands of millennials. So this is not just a theoretical discussion. Can we welcome everyone, even if their ideas about politics and social issues are different than ours? Even if their ideas about God and faith are different than ours? We don't have to accept beliefs that are in conflict with our own values, and we don't have to change our values to believe the same things that other people believe, but are we confident enough in our own faith to make a space here for people who may be different than us? And I realize that it's not really appropriate to use the words we and us as if everyone in this room shares the same opinions about these things. I know that some of you are on the other side of some social issues than I am. 
Thank you for being here. I respect the fact that you are willing to listen to me with courtesy. I'm not interested in forcing everyone to have the same convictions that I do, but I want us to imagine what Creekside would look like if we welcomed everyone. Not if we just tolerate most people, but if we actually welcome everyone. Do you think each of us could commit to the work? Sometimes it's really hard work of seeing every other person at Creekside as a beloved child of God. And yes, this means the people we have known for years and years, as well as the guests who walk through our doors for the first time. Can you greet them warmly, treat them with respect and courtesy, listen to their stories, Share your own struggles and how God has been faithful to you. I know some of you are probably thinking, right, you go first. I have spent a good part of my life trying to be a perfect person. It hasn't gone very well. What I ended up with is being a pretty good person who was completely shattered by my inability to live up to other people's expectations, including my own. It's not a unique story. It's not really a dramatic one. But it is a pretty vulnerable thing to stand in front of a congregation knowing that there is no way that everyone here is going to be happy with what I'm doing. This would be the case, even if this were a much smaller church. <laughs> this would be the case even if it were only me. I would never be enough. And that's why I need Jesus Christ. I speak about welcoming everyone because I speak from experience. Because that is what saved me. When I realized I could no longer identify with the Pharisees, the religious elite, I was actually one of the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Now, that doesn't mean that things don't get under my skin sometimes, and I get back into my Pharisee thinking, and I have to remind myself, it is just ridiculous for a lame person to look down on the blind man. Jesus came so that we could all be welcome. Jesus came so that we could welcome everyone. And that is what grace is about. And if I have received grace, I ought to be the first person, the very first person to offer grace to others. And if someone has not received the grace of Jesus Christ, then they need to be surrounded by people who can show them that grace is a real thing. That is what we do when we welcome everyone. We are going to be sharing the service of communion today. You are all invited to the Lord's table. It's not my table, even though it's my privilege to serve here. It's not even Creekside's table, even though we have set it for you. It is the Lord's table, and you are invited here because of the grace of Jesus Christ. 
I want to say a few words about how we are going to share communion today and give you a few things to reflect on while we have our communion service. First of all, I'd like you to listen to the words of the song that Tom Nowicki will be singing as we have communion. And there will be some images on the screen as well that I'd invite you to watch. Second of all, I'd like you to think about the parable that we heard from Luke and who you identify with in that story. Is it the host who's throwing the big dinner? The guests who were invited but declined to come? The poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame? Or the servant who was sent to bring them all in? That's all the characters there are. You have to choose one of those. And finally, think about how you could extend a welcome to somebody here at Creekside. Not just today, but today is a great time to start. Think about those things. Here's how we are going to do communion. We're going to have you stay in the seats today, stay in your pews. We will have a blessing for the bread and a blessing for the cup, and I will serve the deacons. They will bring the communion elements to you. When the bread comes to you, you may take a piece and eat it immediately and then pass it along to your neighbors. And then when the cup comes to you, take a little cup out of the tray and drink it and replace the cup in the tray. And when everyone has been served, we will have a prayer of thanksgiving and our closing hymn and benediction. <laughs>